Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your speaker, Chris McCann. If you'd like more information or to hear more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now, with your evening Bible study, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible study in the book of Revelation. Tonight is study number four of Revelation chapter nine. And we're going to be reading the second verse. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. We've been talking about this for the last couple of studies, that the angel, uh, or the, excuse me, the as the fifth angel sounded, and a star fell from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. That is referring to Jesus himself, who, uh, according to Revelation 1.18, has the keys of hell and death. And the bottomless pit identifies with hell. As we read in Revelation 20, that Satan was bound and uh, shut up in the bottomless pit for a figurative period of time of a thousand years and then he must be loosed and we compared that last time with second peter 2 that spoke of god um, casting the angels down to hell and binding them with chains of darkness uh, unto the judgment of the great day we realize that that language can only be describing the condition of hell since Satan and the fallen angels were never uh, cast into a place called hell. The Bible uh, won't allow for that kind of idea. And therefore, God uh, can bring individuals into the condition of hell. Now, God did it with Satan and God did it with the Lord Jesus Christ. From the foundation of the world, we know the Bible says Christ died, and death and hell are synonymous, as as sometimes hell, the Hebrew and the Greek word translated as hell, is translated as grave, and the grave is where you put the dead. So when Christ died from the foundation of the world, it was as though he was in hell, and then he rose from the dead, as we read in Psalm 16 in verse 10 for thou will not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption and so Christ rose from the dead from the foundation of the world and was declared to be the son of God the first begotten of the dead and as the son he created the world then Jesus entered into the world and beginning in the Garden of Gethsemane, Thursday evening, God forsook him, and and Christ began um, to suffer uh, as God was punishing him, pouring out wrath upon him. The only difference was that Jesus was not bearing sins, and therefore he was not making payment for sins, but this was a demonstration, um, a tableau, Uh, showing forth what he had done already from the foundation of the world. Because, of course, there was no world, there was no people. And so God determined to send the Son into the world as the light of the world. And the Bible says, whatsoever does make manifest is light. And so Christ made manifest the things he had done um, from the the world's foundation in, in dying and resurrecting. And so he began to suffer in the garden. And the Bible speaks of a period of three days and three nights that the Lord Jesus compares to Jonah in the whale's belly. And very significantly, we read in Jonah 2 that Jonah cries out, Out of the belly of hell cried I. And that word hell is Sheol, the same word hell used throughout the Old Testament. And And so that teaches us that God also placed the Lord Jesus Christ in the condition of hell. 
uh, even though Christ never went to a place called hell, just that the fallen angels were placed in a condition of hell, and and that is of being under the wrath of God, of of um, being cut off, of being forsaken, of being placed in darkness, and uh, another. Uh, aspect of the condition of hell concerning the fallen angels is that once Jesus uh, who took upon him the seed of Abraham and did not take on him the nature of angels once he was born into the world and once he went to the cross and and finally demonstrated all that he had done it was certain it was guaranteed that God may no provision for any angelic beings and therefore the the angels were cast down to hell and and chained in chains of darkness and that darkness uh, it is really describing the fact that there was no salvation possible for the fallen angels and and that is a big aspect of hell once it is determined, once it is decreed by God that there is no possibility of salvation, then that is a, a major uh, aspect of being in the condition of hell. And, and so, uh, as we're reading here in Revelation 9, that the Lord Jesus has opened up the bottomless pit, opened up the deep. And, and the deep identifies with hell, hell down below. And once he did open the bottomless pit, there arose a smoke out of the pit. The word arose is very important because notice that we're not reading here that Christ opened up the pit and then he gathered all of the wicked of the world and cast them into the pit as he did with Satan. Uh, we find language that he was bound in, in the bottomless pit or in the deep. But there's there's not that kind of language here. We, we don't read of the unsaved being gathered and thrown into this deep pit, into this bottomless pit, into hell. No, it, it's not that the people of the world are thrown down, but rather that the condition of hell beneath is coming up. The smoke arose out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And that language of a great furnace indicates that God's wrath is burning. At, you know, the Bible tells us that God is angry with the wicked and he long-sufferingly, patiently endured the sins of man while he waited for the elect to hear the gospel and become saved. But once God completed his salvation program, once he saved the last of the elect, the last one whose name was recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that that happened before the Lord shut the door on May 21, 2011. Once that last individual to be saved became saved, then God no longer would patiently wait. No longer would he long-sufferingly put up with the sins and iniquities of mankind and their rebellion. But he took action. And although it was spiritual action an action that man cannot see with his physical eyes, an action that man is largely ignorant of. It was action, nonetheless, the action of shutting the door of heaven, the action of darkening the sun, of darkening the moon, of putting out the light of the candlestick, of silencing the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride. In all these ways and many more, God is declaring that he has ended salvation for the world. He has closed his salvation program and never again will anyone become saved. And therefore, he has brought up hell from beneath to 
the inhabitants of the earth. Fear and the pit, as it says, let me, let me read that, and the snare are upon thee in um, Isaiah chapter 24. It says in verse 17, Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And uh, we've looked at the word snare before, and we realize that in Luke 21, verse 35, when judgment day comes, that God does say it will come as a snare upon all the inhabitants of the earth. But why the pit? Why is the pit upon the inhabitants of the earth. Well, we're reading why in Revelation 9, in, in verses 1 and 2, it's a bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Four times God uses the word pit. And it's to emphasize the universal nature of the judgment that has now come upon the whole world and fear and the snare and the pit are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. The condition of the pit is now the condition of the world. The pit was full of smoke, the wrath of God, and the pit um, as the smoke rolls, as, a, as the, this smoke of a great furnace it, it darkened the sun. It darkened the air by reason of the smoke of the pit. And you see, it's indicating that God's wrath, typified by that smoke, has put out the sun, put out the light of the gospel uh, to the people of the world. And, and so, really, we can understand what God is saying here in Revelation 9, 1 and 2, if we were to try and summarize it is uh, the summary would be that hell rises and comes to the earth. Hell has risen up and overtaken all of the people of the world, all of the unsaved inhabitants of the earth. And we we saw also, and I like to read this uh, verse again, uh, but in context in Psalm chapter nine. In Psalm 9, God makes the statement that the wicked shall be turned into hell. But let's look at some of the context here, beginning in verse 7. Psalm 9, verse 7. But Jehovah shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Jehovah also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Jehovah, has not forsaken them that seek thee. And it's, it's very interesting how verses 7 and 8, God speaks of his judgment throne, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. And that reminds us, of the statement found in Romans 2 verse 5 that the day of wrath is the day of revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And here it's speaking of God judging the world in righteousness. And notice it goes on to say he shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Ministering the word of God will be ministering judgment to the people. And then in verses 9 and 10, um, seems unusual that God links or, or puts together this with the previous verses. Jehovah also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Jehovah, has not forsaken them that seek thee. And isn't it interesting how God is speaking of judging the world and then quickly speaks of being a refuge, a refuge in times of trouble for the oppressed. And now we can understand why um, he would say this in that context, because as God is judging the world today, presently, where are the elect? Well, the believers are living in the world in the day of judgment. And who is our 
only refuge. God is, and he is our only hope and comfort. And we know, since the Bible tells us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, that uh, it's true, thou, Jehovah, has not forsaken them that seek thee. And even though that's true, that is a fact. God will never leave nor forsake his people. That the Bible guarantees us that. Yet, it's also interesting. And, well, it, it's very strange since May 21, 2011. The circumstances that have developed for the people of God. It, it could almost appear as if God had forsaken his people. I mean, God's people trusted him and his word implicitly. They trusted the Bible as uh, the word of God revealed a great many truths never before known. The people of God leaned upon these things, including information concerning the day of judgment occurring on May 21, 2011. And yet, Things did not develop as we had thought. And we entered into this period of time and became a mockery and a laughing stock. And there was great reviling. And it seems that even that which previously was a comfort and a strength to us was removed. And God's people were isolated and alone. They they did not have the things that that they had been able to rely on previously before the day of judgment came. And we wonder why is this? Why these strange circumstances? And and we have to admit, it was very strange circumstances came about when suddenly uh, we realized that we were not to share the gospel anymore, that we were not to go forth with the word of God as we had always done. And we were not to seek lost sheep, but now to feed sheep. And everything seemed turned around and upside down. And where was God? Why such confusion? Why was there such turmoil spiritually for so many days after that day came and went? And so there, there really uh, was um, an appearance. Never, it was never the case. And it never could possibly be the case. But there was an appearance as though God had forsaken us. Certainly from the perspective of the world and of the church and of all the enemies of God as they looked upon the believers. Now, they, um, look, they had trusted in the Bible and only the Bible. They had trusted in the methodology of comparing spiritual with spiritual and, and they didn't trust the church and they didn't trust the writings of theologians and and all the traditional teachings and now look at them the, look at their situation they were wrong they they were dead wrong and we were right we told them and now we know God is with us and now we know God is not with them you see how the appearance could be from the perspective of others oh they they were out for the money. They uh, swindled all of those who sent in their funds. And, and so the world began to speak evil of the people of God. And, of course, the church, uh, who really does know better, you know, the church very much is fully aware of Mr. Camping's outstanding reputation for never taking a dime and for using all the funds uh, for the ministry of the gospel and obviously uh, yes uh, a large amount of money was taken in but obviously when it's considered all the billboards and advertising that went into effect in the days leading up to that point it's very obvious where the money went to actually it's amazing it's an incredible thing that um, there could have been so much advertising it, as a result of relatively very little money. I mean, the, the world probably puts up as much money to advertise one minute on Super Bowl Sunday as was used to advertise uh, all over the earth in, in the days prior to May 21, 2011. But 
all these things came to a point where certainly the, the child of God even alone in prayer had to think, Oh Lord, what, what is happening? What is going on? Are you with me? Could it be that you have left me, that you have forsaken me? And of course the believer deep down even in possibly thinking something like that would realize oh that can't be I know that God would never leave me and the believer also realized I know the the truth because God's sheep hear his voice we heard the truth we know that when God gives us the proper methodology and it's followed that we can be very certain normally of finding truth and so it, it yet following these truths led us into this condition, into this situation of post May 21, where uh, so so many strange things, unusual things, things we had never experienced were were now taking place. And so we find here though that God is a refuge in times of trouble, and uh, that He will not forsake them that seek Thee. And God has not forsaken his people. Although in appearance of being forsaken, that, that's a different story. Yes, the, there has been an appearance that God has forsaken his people. Well, in verse 11, it says in Psalm 9, Sing praises to Jehovah, which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. And again, this is in keeping with the context of Judgment Day. We know that once God saved all of the elect, the complete body of Christ, or the whole temple, the spiritual house of God was formed, and then he entered in. He dwelleth in Zion. And that is occurring now. And, and so this statement in verse 11 to sing praises to Jehovah which dwelleth in Zion matches up with, for instance, language that we find in Joel chapter 3. Remember Joel 3.15 says, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Jehovah also shall roar out of Zion, that is, speak as the next part of the verse goes on to explain and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake but Jehovah will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel so shall ye know that I am Jehovah your God dwelling in Zion my holy mountain then shall Jerusalem be holy and there shall be and there shall no strangers pass through her any more that is the true bride of Christ, the eternal Jerusalem. That is the Zion. And notice in the context of the darkened sun and moon that God speaks of dwelling in Zion. And Matthew 24, 29 tells us immediately after the tribulation, the sun is darkened. And that fits once we understand, yes, God saved the great multitude. He completed that spiritual body of Christ on May 21 and then he darkened the sun and it goes hand in hand with now Jehovah dwelling in Zion the the uh, spiritual Jerusalem and so in Psalm 911 sing praises to Jehovah which dwelleth in Zion in verse 12 when he maketh inquisition for blood he remembereth them he forgetteth not the cry of the humble and this would relate to those souls that are under the altar that we read about earlier in our study of the book of Revelation in chapter 6 as they were crying out how long holy and true is, is that how it goes there in Revelation 6 verse 9 and when he had opened the fifth seal I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O Lord holy and true does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And that uh, agrees with Psalm 9, verse 12. He maketh inquisition for blood. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. And 
The humble will be the souls of them that are under the altar, that are covered by the blood of Christ. And then it says, let, let's skip down just to um, be able to finish Psalm 9 in this study. In verse 15, the heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made, in the net which they hid is their own foot taken. Jehovah is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands, Hegeon Selah. And here we read of the pit and the snare. Fear in the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. As a snare, Luke 21, 35 says, shall it come on all that dwell upon the face of the earth. And then in verse 17 of Psalm 9, the wicked shall be turned into hell, Sheol, and all the nations that forget God. And this is what God has done. Once God ended his salvation program, once he finally and eternally shut the door of heaven, so now no one on this side of heaven, uh, you know, God's people are on that side because uh, at the moment of salvation we're, um, we're lifted up into heavenly places to be seated in Christ Jesus. And yet the unsaved are on this side in the world and they're under the wrath of God. The wrath of God abides upon them normally. But once God shut heaven's door and sealed the only entrance that anyone could ever use to enter into the kingdom of heaven, he guaranteed the destruction of every unsaved individual and therefore he turned the wicked into hell, into the grave, into death. Their death, their eternal death is now guaranteed. It is sure. It is certain. It will not change. Nothing can ever cause God to open that door. What God has shut, no man can open. And God confirms this. As we read, when once the master of house is risen up and is shut to the door, and then there will be many crying out, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he'll, uh, he'll not come running to open the door, but rather he'll say, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. There is no opening the door in the day of judgment. There is no translating any longer those in darkness into the light. And then it says in verse 18 of Psalm 9, For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. And this is again a strange placement of a verse, isn't it? As we've been looking and reading from verse 11, it was very consistently focused on judgment day, on the wrath of God being poured out upon the wicked. And yet again, as God speaks of turning the wicked into hell and all the nations that forget God, he pauses and turns his attention to the needy, who can only be the elect, and the poor, who also would typify the elect. And he says, they will not always be forgotten. Now the wicked are eternally forgotten, but not the needy. And the expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Now, isn't that, isn't that interesting? Here God is referring to the hope of his people who are living, alive, and remaining on the earth, waiting for that final day. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies. You can hear these studies Monday through Friday over Pal Talk, Skype, eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over your phone. For more information or to hear other studies, visit www.ebiblefellowship.com. Until our next study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.